Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this video will conclude the first day of the Battle of Shiloh as the Union Army pulls back to its final defensive line. Normally, I attempt to represent the battle down to the regimental level, but with so many small units clustered in the Union battle line, it was going to be extremely difficult to identify all of the regiments. So I chose to identify where many brigaded units were on the battlefield. And you'll notice where there are two brigades labeled Veach. That brigade, as well as others, had regiments spread out all along the defensive line, many of them not fighting with their own brigade or even division in some cases. It had been a long and bloody day for Albert Sidney Johnson's army, now under PGT Beauregard. They had pushed the Union Army back towards Pittsburgh Landing and captured thousands of enemy troops but it had come at a terrible cost. They lost their army commander and numerous division and brigade commanders. It was a confusing time for the Confederate High Command, but to fully secure the victory, they needed to follow up on their success. At Pittsburgh Landing, Grant was taking the battered divisions of Sherman, McClernand, W.H.L. Wallace, and Hurlbut and formed them into another defensive line to defend the landing. He had been building this third line since about 2.30 p.m and by 5 p.m. it was prepared to hold the landing at all costs. One of the most influential men coordinating the placement of troops was Grant's Chief of Staff, Colonel Joseph D. Webster, who was an experienced artilleryman. As expected from a cannoneer, this third line would depend heavily on cannons to overwhelm attacking Confederates. So influential was Webster that when he was looking for artillery to man the line, he found the 1st Illinois Light Artillery Battery H who didn't have horses to pull the pieces and the men had never fired their guns. Webster, in the middle of the battle, drilled the battery of men and placed sacks of corn around them to create a small earthwork to calm the nerves about the approaching enemy. Once the infantry and artillery was in place, men remembered seeing Webster mounted on his horse, riding up and down the line shouting encouragement saying, stand firm boys, they can never carry this line in the world. Along with the infantry and artillery, two major gunboats, the Lexington and the Tyler, sat in the Tennessee River, prepared to deliver devastating volleys in order to defend the landing. The first to probe the new position was Wharton and Brewer's bands of cavalry, but they were no match for the Blue Infantry, no matter how bloody the Union troops were. The brigades of Pond and Claiborne, instead of heading towards the Hornet's Nest, were distracted by Yankee movements to the northeast. They would be the next Confederates to probe Grant's impressive third defensive line. Pond's men took the brunt of the attack, engaging with the group of blue troops under the command of Colonel Wraith. Pond's regiments attacked in echelon, with the 18th Louisiana attacking first, being pushed back, and then the Orleans Guards made their attempt, but they could not withstand the hail of lead thrown at them. Finally, the 16th Louisiana made a half-hearted attack against Wraith but after witnessing what happened to their advancing comrades, their commander broke off the attack early. The Union line resembled a T at that point, but after the Louisianians were driven off, Grant's army pulled back into an L shape. To the east, Braxton Bragg worked feverishly to assemble what brigades he could to follow up on the advance. He assembled elements of four brigades, Chalmers, Jackson, Anderson, and two regiments from Gladden's brigade now under Zachariah Dees. When the order came to advance, many of the men refused to move against so impressive of a defensive line, peppered with artillery. Some had marched over six miles that day and fought for 13 hours. They would find refuge in a ravine from the artillery blasts and small arms fire. Chalmers' men, and to a lesser extent Jackson's troops, were the only ones to engage with the blue troops, but it's debated how much fighting actually took place. Chalmers reported making multiple charges, but this seems like an exaggeration as others, both Union and Confederate, reported mostly just skirmishing. The Union artillery did their job intimidating the rebels and driving off the battery attached to Chalmers Brigade, which had weathered the battle with the Mississippians since the first attacks. As both sides hunkered down for the night, exhausted over what had transpired that day, Grant began receiving reinforcements by the thousands from Don Carlos Buell across the river and Lew Wallace making his way south. Numerous tales have swirled around the historical record attempting to explain why Wallace was late and didn't make it to the battle on the first day. 
He did not receive the orders to move until 11.30 a.m. when the quartermaster of the army, Captain A.S. Baxter, relayed that information to him. Now there is dispute as to in what fashion was Wallace supposed to travel. Wallace believed he was to move to the right of the army, which meant near Sherman's position. But Grant argued that he ordered Wallace to come directly to the landing. However, the commander of the army admitted that he did not know what the order actually said once it got to Wallace. The order went from Grant to Captain John A. Rollins to Captain Baxter to Wallace. Nevertheless, Wallace had his men prepare lunch and was on what he thought to be the quickest route to the scene of the fighting by noon. Grant sent numerous couriers to hurry Wallace along, and when he was about to cross Clear Creek, Grant's aide, Captain W. R. Raleigh, arrived and asked where he was going. Wallace replied that he was heading to the right of the army. The messenger turned pale and said, Don't you know Sherman has been driven back? Why, the whole army is within half a mile of the river, and it's a question if we are not all going to be driven into it. Once Wallace recovered from the news, he countermarched his division and headed down the river road, guided by local civilians. Wallace would arrive on the field late, but only through miscommunication and not enough information to make the correct decisions. During the night of April 6th, Grant placed his reinforcements in the line, despite a harsh rainstorm consuming the battlefield. One soldier remembered, it was dark and it rained and the only relief we had was to pull off our knapsacks and sit on them for a change. I remember that the rain ran down the back of my neck into my shoes. The Army of the Tennessee's camp equipment had been captured by Confederates and the reinforcements had left most of their equipment behind to make better time. One captain informed his colonel that the regiment had no food. He was told to tell his men to sit down and suck their thumbs. A lucky soldier who got food stated we were furnished with some crackers and raw meat which was eaten without cooking as we dare not make a fire. Grant was also recovering from the scenes he had witnessed that day. One member of his staff got decapitated by a cannonball right next to him, covering the army commander with blood and brain matter. Grant rode all over the battlefield examining the fighting personally and had some close calls. A canister shot hit his sword scabbard and bent it. He set up headquarters under a big oak tree after being sickened by the screams and anguished cries of the wounded in the makeshift hospital that had been his headquarters. Sherman came to Grant under his tree in the rain with the idea of broaching the subject of retreat, thinking the only thing just then possible, as it seemed to me, was to put the river between us and the enemy and recuperate. At the last minute, he became embarrassed and blurted out, Well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? A determined Grant, his mind already made up, responded, Yes, lick him tomorrow, though. He then ordered me to get all things ready at daylight the next day to assume the offensive. Grant was determined to use his numbers and the Confederates' own exhaustion against them the next day to win a major victory. Wagons full of ammunition traversed the defensive lines distributing ammunition for the next day's attack. One soldier wrote, No one talked of tomorrow. We knew we had to fight a victorious enemy who was expecting an easy ending to the battle, nothing less than unconditional surrender but we knew in our hearts that we were going to lick them. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland To educate the world is his mission A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian